Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about microRNA. You might be watching this video because this year's Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology was awarded to Victor Ambrose and Gary Rufkin for their joint discovery of microRNA in 1993. You might have heard of mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, there's lots of different types of RNAs. In this video, I'm going to briefly cover what microRNA is, its backstory, and why it matters. So in 1993, Rufkin and Ambrose both published their results in the same issue of the journal Cell. Ambrose discovered a gene in C. elegans, the model organism nematode worm. He discovered a part of a gene that coded for a teeny tiny part of RNA, but it didn't encode for a protein. And Rufkin cloned this gene, and both scientists realized that it matched a complementary sequence in LIN14 DNA. It's pretty cool that the efforts were collaborative between the two labs, but it took many more years of research to truly discover all of the functionality of microRNAs and their importance in many different types of organisms. So what is microRNA? So it's commonly abbreviated as miRNA. It's a non-coding RNA molecule, meaning it does not code for a protein. It doesn't send a message that becomes a protein. It's about 21 to 22 nucleotides long, and it's found in almost all eukaryotic organisms, including you and me, C. elegans, plants, and some viruses. Its role is post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. So that means it helps cells determine which genes to actually go and become proteins and which ones that need to be degraded or blocked during translation. So that's a lot of vocabulary. Let's back up a little bit and review protein synthesis. So protein synthesis is how we get our DNA message transcribed and translated into a protein. So it's basically how your genes become the traits that an organism actually displays. Now, in regular high school biology, you probably learned that DNA can be transcribed into an mRNA message, which then leaves the nucleus and is translated into a protein. So an oversimplification of this process looks like this. Your original DNA strand begins in the nucleus, it separates and then is transcribed into a strand of mRNA. That mRNA leaves the nucleus where it goes to a ribosome where it can be translated with the help of tRNAs that bring over amino acids that match up with the codons on the mRNA strand. Those amino acids are linked together using peptide bonds and we get a final amino acid sequence, which is usually several hundred to thousands of amino acids, not long, not just these three shown here in the diagram. Those amino acids are then folded into a functional protein that provides a certain role for the cell. Now that's just the basics. We know that genes cannot all be expressed at the same time in every single cell. That would just be too much. So genes can be turned on and off at appropriate times and locations within an organism. There's things like transcription factors, and of course microRNAs that help in the function of regulating this gene expression. There's lots of different levels of gene expression in eukaryotic organisms. We once thought that introns were just junk DNA that went into the trash that were degraded. But in fact, some introns can become things like miRNAs or siRNAs that help regulate gene expression too. So miRNAs or microRNAs come in here during post-transcriptional regulation before that mRNA is going to be translated into a protein. Let's see how it works. So our microRNA doesn't start out as just 22 nucleotides long. It actually starts off as a little bit longer and it folds over onto itself. Then a protein called dicer comes in and cuts the RNA into smaller fragments which we see here. Another protein complex, RNA-induced silencing complex, or RISC, arrives and converts these fragments into single-stranded bits of microRNA. Then this RISC complex with the microRNA will bind to the target mRNA at the complementary strands. Don't look too closely at the colors here. I didn't try to match them in the diagram. So then what happens? Well, one of two things. This complex can cause degradation of the mRNA, so the mRNA itself breaks up and does not become a protein or it can actually block translation. So this risk complex blocks the translation from occurring at the ribosome. And so we still also do not have a protein in that case. So why does any of this matter? Gene regulation due to microRNAs can play a really important role in the development of organisms and how different cellular functions are controlled. This is really important in things like studying disease, especially cancer research, and can help us develop new treatments or identify different diseases. For example, we can identify different cancers based on the microRNAs that are present within a cell. So remember, microRNAs don't code for proteins. They're non-coding RNA molecules, but they're really important in gene regulation and helping us control which genes actually get translated into proteins within cells. They're present in nearly all eukaryotic organisms and the Nobel Prize for their discovery is well-deserved. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.